Good morning, Grace United Methodist Church. How are you? Good. All right, let's get ready to sing. Let's stand. Lord, I lift your name on high. seated. Let's join together in singing the Lamb of God. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. Well, it's good to see all of you here this morning. I'll say for me, it's good to be back. Uh, Alana and I were out of town last week traveling, and so uh, it's good for us to see all of you again uh, this morning as we worship here at Grace. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in the life that Christ has given us. Amen? Amen. If you would, uh, please take the time to fill out the response card. Put that in the... Uh, 
little offering tray as we pass those around just so we can keep track of how many people are here and who's here so we can let you know about the things that are going on in the life of our church and thank you for coming and if there's anything we can do for you feel free to check uh, the the ways that we can serve you on uh, the card that's provided for you. I do have a few announcements that I would like to plug for you. The first one is that we are having communion today. Uh, if you want to come forward and do the normal way that we serve communion, you're more than welcome to, and we encourage you to do that. If you are more comfortable with staying in your seat and receiving the prepackaged communion sets, we can serve you in that way as well. So whenever we get around there, just raise your hand if you want one of the prepackaged sets, and we'll set you up. Everybody got it? Uh, Friendship Club, Tuesday, May 3rd. Games begin at 10, meal at noon. Uh, upper rooms are available outside. And then we have a breakfast included work day on May 14th from 8 a.m. to noon. We would encourage everyone to come. Uh, if you come for breakfast, you got to stay for work. And so don't, don't stay for one and not the other. Uh, and, but we, we'd love to have you there. Parents night out, uh, 6 to 9.30 Friday on May 20th. If you're interested in that, talk to Robin. And then churchwide lunch, May 22. Contact Alice Higginbotham uh, to sign up for the food. Uh, I do have one more um, rather serious announcement uh, on behalf of, of two members of this church, so I'd like everybody's undivided attention. Trevor and Joanne are pregnant. Yeah. We, we are beyond elated for you guys and praying for a, a safe and happy and wonderful pregnancy. And so we're looking forward to that. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, you are the Lamb of God. You are the Prince of Peace. You are our beginning and our end. You are our provider and our sustainer, and you have brought us here this morning. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift, whether it be the gift of new life, the gift of worshiping you on your holy day, the, wor the gift of uh, spending time uh, with one another uh, in Christian service, or the gift of just looking up and saying that this is the day that you've made and we get to live in the joy and the light of your creation and salvation. And we just thank you for that this morning. Let everything that we do in this place be pleasing to you, Father. And we say all this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. If you would, let's stand for our affirmation of faith, number 881, it will be the Apostles' Creed. This is something that Christians throughout the centuries, uh, regardless of denomination or theological persuasion, have said that this unites us uh, in our Christian belief. And so let's say it together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are glad to have you worshiping with us here at Grace this morning. Whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, we are glad to have you, and we are glad to welcome you to this holy place as we gather to worship God and all that he has done for us. We do want to know who you are, so if you haven't done so yet, then please fill out the, the little tear-off section of your bulletin. That would be a big help to us. 
And the prepackaged communion sets are actually on the back table. So you can pick up one of those, slip out during one of the hymns if you would prefer to do it that way, or wave at one of the ushers, and they'll be glad to bring one to you. So as we come to a time of prayer in our service, I do want to remind you of the prayer request list that is listed on the back of your bulletin. If you have someone or something that you would specifically like for us to pray for, then you can list it on that tear-off section of your bulletin so that we can put it on our list. We were talking about prayers this morning and confirmation and how important they are. And so, so I'm reminded, wanted to remind you that if you have something on your heart that you'd like for us to pray for, we want to pray for you. We want to pray for that situation. A couple of folks that I want to specifically mention to you, um, we want to continue to pray for the family of Mona Jowers Kayer, who was um, laid to rest yesterday. That's Kimba Lou's mother, so please continue to pray for that family. Also, um, I found out this week that Mallory Cole Demers had a daughter, Lola Michelle, on Wednesday, and so um, I'll have more details for you about that um, coming up, but we rejoice with them in that addition to their family. Also want to ask your prayers for one of our members, John Barnett, who is speaking at Jonesboro United Methodist Church this morning as he is a lay speaker for them. So I know John would appreciate your prayers as he leads worship for the Jonesboro, our friends down at Jonesboro. So those are some of the things that are on our hearts today. Of course, we want to continue to pray for peace in our world. We want to continue to pray for all of our local mission partners and our missionaries across the world. So those are there for you. I'd encourage you to take your bulletin home and to continue to pray for those folks throughout the week. Are there others that you know of that are in need of our prayers this morning that you would like to mention uh, for us uh, before we pray? Yes, ma'am. From Mark Roberts. The family, Mark Roberts and that family. Okay. Others this morning? Yes, sir. For John Wagner and our confirmation folks, you'll want to mark the 22nd of May on your calendar. It's going to be a very special day with confirmation and then the meal to follow. So I know that you'll want to be here for that. Uh, also, uh, I know that uh, in my house, it's a very um, unusual time. So pray for students and teachers in the time of testing and um, state testing and that kind of thing. So, so I know that they would appreciate your prayers also. Others this morning? Okay. Then let us join together in prayer. O oh Lord, we are so grateful that we can gather in your house to worship you. And Lord, in, in the midst of everything going on in our lives, in the many, in midst of everything that's going on in our world, Lord, we pray that you would help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, just for an hour or so, may we focus on you. May we allow you to come into this place and to work in and through us. We invite your Holy Spirit to come in and lead us and guide us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us the ears, the, the ears to hear you, the eyes to see you, and the hearts to respond in faith to what you say to us. And Lord, as we think about seeing, we are reminded of Saul and his miraculous conversion. Lord, you did so many great and mighty things through him that you turned his life around. You even changed his name. And Lord, he went from a persecutor of the church to a champion of the church what a turnaround. And so, Lord, as we think about our own conversion, about those people who have helped us along the way this morning, Lord, we pray that you would move in our hearts and lives and that Paul's conversion story would be our story, that we would follow Jesus and that we would see his light. And, Lord, even as we gather in this place, we know that there are many who are in need of our, our prayers. We do rejoice with those who are rejoicing with good news, and we give you thanks for that. We also remember so many others who are in need of your help. Lord, for those who are ill, we pray your healing touch to be upon them. Lord, for others who have lost a loved one to death, we pray your peace that passes understanding to be with them. And Lord, for all the things that concern us, whether it's about work or school or friends or family or something else, Lord, what we know is that you love us, you care for us, and you hear us when we pray. And it's all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now as our ushers come to receive our offering, let us pray together. O oh Lord, we are so grateful for the many blessings that you have given us, the blessings of this beautiful day, the blessings of family and friends, 
the blessings that are so great when we sit down to number them, we cannot. And so, Lord, as we give you back a portion of what you've given us, we ask your blessings on these gifts that we give, that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ through them. And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in singing hymn number 591, Rescue the Perishing.
seat. Amen. Thank you, choir, for sharing with us. We, we're glad to have you with us today. Well, last week we started talking about a new series out of the book of Acts where we're talking about the early church and how it spread and the surprising and miraculous things that God did. And so today we come to another one of those surprising, unexpected acts of God. And I'll be reading out of the book of Acts, chapter 9 verses 1 through 22, and this is the story of Saul's conversion. So I invite you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There was a young boy in a Sunday school class that the pastor happened to be teaching that day. And in the Sunday school class, the pastor asked the children about the meaning of certain religious words like, what does it mean to be baptized, repentance, all of those kinds of things. Well, the boy was very interested and was fascinated to learn the meaning to these new words. But then the pastor asked the children, what does the word conversion mean? Well, this stumped the children. They had never heard of that word. And, but one little boy in the back of the class, he thought for a moment, and then he gave the only definition that he knew. He said, I know what a conversion is. It's the extra point that's kicked after a touchdown. <laughs> well, I hope that we know more about conversion than that because we have a basic problem as humans. There is something wrong at the very heart of humanity. All you have to do is turn on the news or open the newspaper to realize that this world is not the way God designed it to be. There is something sick, something twisted, something wrong, sometimes something where we choose our way instead of God's way. Now we have another big theological word for that. We call it sin when we choose our way instead of God's way. But what is the solution? The solution is called conversion, which we see this morning. Now, conversion in a biblical sense, it means literally to change direction. In the Old Testament, it is the Hebrew word shub, meaning to return or turn back. The verb form of that word appears over a thousand times in the Old Testament and it is the twelfth most frequently used verb in all of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we use words, Greek words like epistrapho and metanoia to both indicate a change of direction. That word metanoia, it means a literal about face doing 180 degrees different than you were going before. And change is what conversion is all about. There need be no blinding light or angels for conversion. Instead, 
what there must be for conversion is a change of direction. So our text this morning from the book of Acts may be the most famous conversion in all of history. The conversion of a fellow named Saul who became St. Paul. And so the ninth chapter of Acts begins with Saul making a 150 mile journey from Jerusalem to Damascus. And he has one focus to stamp out the fire that is this new religion called Christianity. He has permission to take whoever calls on the name of Jesus to prison and to persecute them on behalf of the Jews in Jerusalem. He is on his way to Damascus when the light finds him. The Bible tells us that on his journey, a light flashed from heaven around him. All of a sudden, without warning, Saul is bathed in S-O-N light, so bright that it is even brighter than S-U-N light. Now, in Acts 26, 13, Paul is giving his testimony to a king named Agrippa. And he says that this happened, this took place, this miracle, this conversion took place at high noon when the sun would have been at its hottest and brightest. And still Paul says that the light I saw from heaven was brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. Of course, we know that this light was none other than the light of Jesus Christ, which makes perfectly good sense. Because in John 8, verse 21, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. David writes in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Now, it's obvious that this is no ordinary light that Paul, that Saul ran into, right? It changed his direction. This light that blinded the eyes in his head opened the eyes of his heart. It led Saul to one of the most dramatic conversions in all of the world. So what can we learn from this surprising, unexpected conversion of a fellow named Saul and what does it mean to us? The first thing I want you to see is that conversion requires surrender. Conversion requires surrender. So remember that Saul is going to Damascus with a mission, right? He's not going to tour the city. He's not going to see the sights. He is not going for a visit. But he is going on a mission to stamp out Christianity. But on his way there, he is sidetracked. And all of his plans go out the window. In fact, Saul is told by Jesus, get up. Go into the city and you will be told what to do. In essence, he is all of these plans that he have, has made that they are set aside. That now God has a new plan for Saul. Jesus has a better idea. God gets Saul's attention in a miraculous and stunning way. Don't ever underestimate how far God might go to get your attention when he really needs to. So Saul is told to go into the city. In fact, you might have noticed as we read chapter 9 that his companions have to lead him by the hand, that he is being led around by those who came to help him. And so Saul has to give up his plans. Saul has to give up his ways. Saul has to give up all that he wants in order to follow Jesus. Saul, who was later renamed Paul, spent the rest of his life finding and living out the answer to the one question, Lord, what do you want me to do? What if, what if we ask that question of ourselves? Lord, what do you want me to do for you? What if we asked it today? What if we asked it tomorrow? What if we asked it every day? Lord, what do you want me to do? The old hymn says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I read something the other day that says, was about the, the titles of hymns if it were how we actually sung it and meant it. And this one would be, some to Jesus I surrender. Some to him I freely give. Because too often... That little word, all, is a tough one. Are we willing to lay our vocation 
on the altar? Are we willing to lay our dreams, our plans on the altar? What about our vocation, our residence, our hopes, our aspirations? Are we willing to surrender those to Jesus also? What part of all don't we understand? Or maybe we are afraid of what Jesus will ask us to do. Bob Allred was the pastor of First United Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta. And in a sermon on this text, he talks about his conversion on a Sunday afternoon at the age of 21. He says, there's been a lot of water go over the dam since then, Bob writes. Sermons preached, degrees earned, but that one singular event on a Sunday afternoon has shaped my entire life. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. What would that mean for you and I to surrender our lives to Jesus? Maybe there are things we need to let go of today. Not of the things that make us, but the things that break us. Conversion, first of all, requires surrender of our plans and instead acceptance of God's plans. Secondly, I want you to see that we have an important part to play in conversion. We have an important part to play in conversion. Now, now I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that the same God that struck Saul with blindness without human assistance could have healed Saul in the same way, without human assistance. But that's not how God chooses to work in Acts chapter 9. And most often it is not how God chooses to work today. Still today, and even in Acts chapter 9, God works through humans. God works through us. You see, that's how God chooses to work to change the world. I believe that God is big enough that he could fix this world and the problems in it with the, 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 the snap of his finger. After all, he spoke the world into existence with just a word. But God chooses to work through us to make a difference in our world and for the people in it, just like Ananias did for Saul. Now, this is both awe-inspiring and frightening for me, wonderful and scary at the same time. Wonderful that God wants to use us to help ourselves and others, but kind of scary in that we might be asked to do something that we don't want to do. After all, that's what happened to Ananias, right? Ananias, when, when God told Ananias to go to Saul, Saul says, God, are you crazy? I mean, I, I know this guy. He has been sent here to kill all of us who follow you. Saul may not have known who Ananias was, but Ananias certainly knew who Saul was. If there was a top ten list of the most hated persecutors of the early church, Saul would have been on it. He probably would have been number one. In fact, Ananias tells God, and I thought this is rather bold on his behalf, right? This man has been persecuting Christians, and you want me to go see him? But Ananias does. Now, this is the first and last time that we will see Ananias in the Bible. We first meet him in Acts chapter 9, and afterwards he fades away as one of those many faithful saints who we no longer see. We have no indication that Ananias is a pastor or even a church leader. It seems that he is just a normal, everyday believer like you and like me. And God has this amazing request. Hey, you know that guy you hate, that guy you're scared of? Go visit him. I'm going to use him. Sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if Ananias had told God no? Would God have found someone else? I think so, and I hope so, for Saul changed the world, and he wrote more than a third of the New Testament. But can you imagine the blessing that Ananias would have missed if he had said no to God? He would have missed seeing Saul go from persecutor to evangelist from this, to this great leader of the early church. Ananias could say, I had a part in that. I, God used me to help that. And sometimes I wonder what blessings we miss just because we aren't willing 
to be obedient to God. You see, every time I serve communion or step into this pulpit or another one like it or lead a Bible study or a Sunday school class or a, a confirmation class or baptize a person or, or do anything related to the church, I'm amazed that I get to have a part in what God is doing in your lives. Now, I'm no vile sinner, but I'm not perfect either. I'm not the example of Christ that I know I should be. But despite that, God chooses to use me. 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 That's who he uses. And he uses you also. Recently, not too long ago, we held Helen Reeves' funeral service here at Grace. Her grandson, a United Methodist pastor in North Carolina, conducted much of the service, and he did a great job. He thanked me for your prayers and your support for his grandmother. He said that when they were going through the house after she had passed away, they found a stack of cards about this high, several feet high, cards and notes from you, from the pastoral care committee that had been sent to her through the years that she had kept and hold on to. You did that, not me. You have a part to play in God's work. What an amazing gift that you and I have a part to play in God's work in this world. Now, I want to give you a homework assignment this week, and don't worry, it's not going to be too hard. First of all, I want you to think of the people who were Ananias to you. The people who were Ananias to you, the people who opened your eyes, maybe it was a, a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a pastor that helped us to see God or maybe to see life in a different way, professionally, personally, academically, all of those things. If they're still on this side, maybe you want to write them a note or give them a call and tell them how God used you, used them in your life. So that's number one. Secondly, I want you to think of somebody that God is calling you to be Ananias to. Someone that God is calling you to open their eyes, to help them to see God, help them to see life in a new way. Maybe they are even sitting here this morning. Because thank God, thank God, we have an important part to play in conversion. Third, I want you to see that conversion is a new way of seeing. Conversion is a new way of seeing. So Ananias, he goes to see Saul, and the first thing he says to him is, Brother Saul, Brother Saul. Can you imagine calling him Brother Saul? The Lord Jesus has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see. Conversion is just like that. It's new eyes in which to see the world and interpret the events that are going on. Conversion is a new way of seeing that when we are converted, we don't see things the same way that we saw them in the past. The physical change and the removal of the scales from Saul's eyes were equivalent to the spiritual change on the inside of Saul's heart. More than Saul's eyes were open that day, Enemies became friends. The hated became loved. An arch enemy became an advocate for Christianity. For Saul, Jesus was now his Lord, his life, his light, and always first and foremost in his life. Many people in America want to call Jesus Christ anything but Lord, that we are very interested in Jesus when, we, when Jana and I went to Branson, we went to the Sight and Sound Theater to see the show Jesus. It was a sold-out show. People were trying to get tickets to go see the show. They wanted to see Jesus, but on Sunday mornings, our churches have more empty pews than anything else. So what is the difference? What happened? How, how can we help others to see Jesus and also remind them that Jesus is our Lord, as well as our Savior. Nine out of ten Americans say they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but only three in ten have chosen to accept Jesus as Lord. Jesus is called Savior in the Bible 24 times. He is called Lord 433 times. 
We must not just acknowledge him as son or Messiah or Savior, but we must accept Jesus as the Lord of our life, the Lord of for us. You see, Saul, this man of violence, he would one day say that Christ is our peace. He would one day say that Christ has broken down the wall of hostility and reconciled us to God. He would one day say in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. If that is not transformation, what in the world is? Conversion is a new way of seeing. The last thing I want you to see is that conversion is a new way of living. Conversion is a new way of living. You see, Paul's life changed. His past had been erased. And now God was going to use him to do something different. Oh, Saul's past, it may have been soiled, but his future was spotless. And so Ananias was sent by God to help him to help him find his new way of living. His previous life was swept away after his Damascus Road experience. His eyes were opened, and so he immersed himself in the teachings of the apostles. He immersed himself in the fellowship of the believers. He studied and prayed, and he became like Jesus. His conversion was not the end, but it was only the beginning. You see, we talk about that a lot with confirmation, is that confirmation is not the end, that when you're confirmed, when you accept Jesus, you haven't figured it all out, but it's a step on the way. Saul, the man of hate, had become Paul, the man of love, and he wanted to share that love wherever he went. Verse 20 tells us that immediately, immediately, right away, he didn't go to seminary, he didn't wait till God appointed him or anointed him, he preached Christ In the synagogues, he said that Jesus is the Son of God. (laughs) It's one of those things that I wish I could have been there. Can you imagine going to synagogue that day? Here is the great inquisitor of the Sanhedrin, carrying with him these documents that demand full cooperation in rooting out the heresy of Christianity. He is given the chief seat, the pulpit. Every eye in the place is on him, and Saul asks for the scriptures to be handed to him, and they know that here, that finally, there is going to be a denunciation of this heresy called Christianity, that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior, the Son of God. Can you imagine the look on their faces when Paul opened his mouth and said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, risen from the dead. He is Lord, and he has appeared to me on the road. Saul met Christ, and when he did, his whole life changed. He became an entirely new person. The rest, they say, is history, that that one life went out and changed the world. No, it was not always easy. Paul, who used to be named Saul, writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I I have known hunger and thirst. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I faced the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. But when I am weak, I have discovered that I am strong in the Lord. Lee Strobel is a professor at Houston Baptist University, and and he converted to Christianity as an adult. Recently, it's been made into a movie and all those kinds of things. But he says that the greatest assurance of his conversion came months later when his five-year-old daughter went up to her mother and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. And she also became a Christian because she knew no arguments in favor of Christianity. She, the little girl, she simply observed that her daddy had changed and she wanted what he had. Her reasoning, if God can do that for daddy, then I want God to do it for me. Never underestimate the impact of a life that has been changed for God. 
Conversion is a new way of living. Thinking about this text this week got me thinking about my own conversion experience. I was seven years old, and the church we attended in Beaumont, Texas, was in revival. I had been asking my parents and my pastor questions about Jesus, but I had not made the decision for myself to follow him. And I distinctly remember that during that service, that during the invitation, I was drawn to the front of the church, much like a magnet, much like a magnet draws iron to it. I knew that I was, I was being called to accept Christ. I knew that I wanted to follow Jesus. It's a feeling that I still remember to this day. I accepted Christ and I was baptized on Easter Sunday. You see, conversion is different for every person. Maybe it happened like that for you. Maybe it didn't. Maybe, maybe you just realized that I follow Jesus. God didn't blind me with light like he did with Saul, nor I suspect will God do so for you. But I imagine that if you think back, you might have had some experiences, some conversion experiences that you remember. Maybe it was when you knelt at an altar like this one at confirmation and hands were laid on you. Or maybe it's when you felt God at a worship service or a church camp or a weekend retreat. Thank God that God is still in the conversion business. So I hope and pray that conversion is more to you than an extra point after a touchdown. I hope that Saul's experience on the Damascus Road will help you see the light and that we all need to be converted. So conversion, it requires surrender. We have an important part to play in conversion. Conversion requires a new way of seeing, and conversion requires a new way of living. Saul became a fellow named Paul. He wrote about a third of the New Testament, and he helped thousands know Jesus, millions throughout the ages. A surprising conversion that changed the world. And the best news for us is that God is still in the converting business, surprisingly working in your life and in mine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now as we come to a time in our service when we gather around the table, when we receive the body and the blood of Christ and we remember all that he has done for us, the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley said that in itself, these sacraments are converting ordinances that lead us and help us to grow closer to God. So I'm going to invite you to take your hymnal and turn with me to page 12 as we prepare to celebrate a service of word and table number two. While you're turning, I want to remind you that this is not a Methodist table. It is our Lord's table. So if you are here this morning and you're a guest, if you, you are welcome at this table. If you simply want to follow Jesus, you are welcome at this table. So all are welcome at the Lord's table. Hear now this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yes, we have sinned, but hear now the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now please join with me in the great thanksgiving across the page. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, 
brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymns. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread... He gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts. And all that Jesus has done for us. In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And now we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body of Christ until, until all the... Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning, we're going to invite you to come by the center aisle after the choir has received. They'll receive first and then come by the center and you may either kneel or stand at the communion rail, whichever is easier for you. You'll be given a piece of bread, please take and eat it. You'll be given a cup of juice, please take and drink it. And after you have eaten the bread and drank the cup, we invite you to um, remain for a moment of prayer and then dismiss yourself back to your seat using the side aisles. There will be no communal table blessing. Instead, you're, you're free to pray as long as you want or even as short as you want. Spend some time at the Lord's table. Also, if you would like to receive the sacrament but are unable to come to the front, just wave at me or get my attention. I'll be glad to bring the sacrament to you and um, have sacrament will travel. So, um, so we'd be glad to bring it to you if you would prefer that way. The choir will be served first, and then it will be, the table will be open to the congregation. The Lord's table is open. Would you come to receive his goodness and mercy and love?
Our closing hymn this morning is number 354, I Surrender All. The altar is open if you'd like to come and pray. I'll also be glad to talk with you if you'd like to know more about accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, allowing him to change your life like he did for Saul, or to become a member of our church here at Grace as we seek to make a difference in Ruston and beyond. We'll sing the odd verses. So the odd verses, 1, 3, and 5, for I surrender all. Would you stand as we sing together? It has been good to see you in God's house today, and we are glad that you have chosen to worship with us. As we finish, I want to remind you about your homework. Um, first, I want you to pick up an upper room that is there in the, the foyer, and I'll have some of those with me. So it's May 1, so it'd be a great time to start that. Secondly, I want you to think about your conversion experience. When did it happen? What did it mean then, and what does it mean to you today? We heard about Saul's. What about yours? And then third, I want you to think about who was Ananias to you? Who was the person that opened your eyes spiritually, academically, professionally, personally, all of those kinds of things? Who was an Ananias to you? And maybe you might want to let them know how they helped you. And then who is God calling you to be Ananias two and four. So, so that's your homework that I want to leave you with as we depart. And so let us close in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for the miracle that you worked for Saul and how you turned his life around. A surprising conversion that he went from hating you to loving you and gave his life in service for you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to to, to convert and to, to be like you, to, to follow you closely each and every day. Lord, we're grateful that we get to have a part in your conversion, that you allow us to have a small part of it, and we're grateful that you work through us. Lord, we pray that as we are become more like Jesus, that it would be a new way of seeing for us, a new way of living for us, and that others would see Jesus in us through the things that we do and say. 
And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you.